Reading with your kids. Hola, Niho, Konnichiwa, Assalamu alaikum, Shalom, Machaba, Boni Boni Wanji, Namaste, Jambo, Bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We are coming to you from the beautiful and like wicked cold neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so delighted and so very honored that you join us in our mission to help all families grow closer through reading. Please be sure to tell all of your family and friends about the show. Tell your kids, teachers, the principal, the librarian. And also please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app on Spotify, Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, wherever you find your podcast. Our guest today is Captain Bill Pinkney. He is here to celebrate his solo sailing trip around the world. Before we invite Captain Bill in to celebrate his book, I want to invite you to visit Amazon and celebrate my first children's picture book. It's called The Great Maritini. And it was written by yours truly with illustrations by my incredibly talented niece, Tiffany Doherty. The Great Maritini is a fun and touching story about Sam, a lovable but far from perfect magician. He's known throughout the land as the Great Maritini. Despite his many mistakes on stage, Sam never gives up on himself. And as a result of that grit and resolve, is able to dazzle audiences with his amazing transformations. Sam also has a kind heart, and he's somebody who cannot walk away from anybody in need. And he soon learns that the greatest transformation of all is transforming feelings of caring into action to help another human being. This would be a great Christmas gift. It's also just a fun read. It's available to read for free if you're a member of Kindle Unlimited. And if you want to pick it up on your Kindle, it's only 99 cents. Check it out today. The Great Maritini by me, Gently. Join us right now from the beautiful island of Puerto Rico. My guest is here today to celebrate something amazing. He documents his story in a book called Sailing Commitment. Please welcome to the show Captain Bill Pinckney. Captain Bill, welcome Hello. aboard. How? Thank you. Glad to be here. Now, the story that you tell in Salem Commitment, this is pretty amazing. You actually sailed around the world by yourself. By myself, under Cape Horn, and uh, stopped in five uh, places around the world. That's incredible. I, I, I just returned from an epic cross-country drive, Boston to Orlando, to St. Louis, to Los Angeles, and then back again. And people think that I'm, I'm pretty amazing that I was able to do that all by myself. And I'm like, not really. You know, I could stop at a Holiday Inn every night and get gas, and it really wasn't a big deal. Like I had audiobooks to listen to. It was actually fun. We're talking about something completely different for you. You're out there in the ocean, and there's nothing. There's no rest areas, no AAA in case you are um, get a flat sail. Does that happen? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, you're you're pretty much on your own out there. Uh it's just you and the in the sky and the sea. And of course a number of birds that you see. Uh -huh. uh, you don't see fish, they're down below and you don't want to join them. No. <laughs> Not at all. So tell me, um where did this idea that you could sail around the world by yourself come from? Well, it came initially from an, an idea from a book I read in the seventh grade. Uh, books can take you anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. And the book I read was about a Polynesian boy who was afraid of the water and was an outcast to his family. And I felt very, very close to his story uh, with my personal story at the time. And uh, he sailed off to, to an island, had a great adventure on the island, and returned home a hero. And I said... That's what I want to do. That was in seventh grade. It took me till I was 55 years old to do it. So it came as an idea to leave a legacy for my grandchildren uh, by sailing around the world, writing to them, and telling them of my adventures as I went along. I ended up, however, with a boat bigger than the one I wanted to, going a different direction instead of through the 
Panama and Suez Canal around Cape Horn. And I had not two grandchildren. I had 30,000 grandchildren who were following me with satellite and radio communication. Wow. Wow. That is incredible. I, now, the, the Cape of Good Horn going down underneath Africa, that's one of those that's one of those places where where I always read about like like no one survives that that's like really really dangerous well actually Cape Horn is not the tip of Africa that's the Cape of Good Hope oh I'm sorry Cape Horn is at the tip of South South America America. and that is a place it's called the Everest of the sea because that uh, the current flows through there very quickly Uh, the bottom goes from 6,000 feet to 600 feet, and it's like sailing through a funnel. And in the olden days, that's how people got from west, the west, east coast to the west coast, by sailing there. And it is one of the most treacherous places in the world. And so why did you decide to do that instead of doing the easy thing through the Panama Canal? I, I've been the Panama Canal. It's great. It might be expensive, but it's, you know, it's uh, pretty. <laughs> <laughs> well, my mentor was... Uh, Sir Robin Knox Johnston, who was the first man to sail solo around the world nonstop. And he advised me that if I was going to go out and go to sea at all, I should go the most difficult way so no no one could ever challenge the fact that I did it uh, like a man and like a true sailor. (laughs) Wow. You were bullied into going around the Cape. (laughs) Well, I wouldn't say bully. Let me say I I talked to the master, Mm -hmm. and the master gave his opinion, and I acquiesced to his opinion. Now, there have only been, was it 50 people who've done this? Well, more than 50 people have done it. Uh, Americans, uh, there are very, very few. I was looking at the, uh, the, the status from the International Society of Cape Horners, which is for anyone who has gone around in a sailboat, of Americans who've done it, there have, only, there have been less than 20 of us. Wow, wow. And you are the first black man to have done this. That's right, from any nation. Wow, wow, incredible. Now, did you grow up with, uh, you know, you, you're you in Fajardo, Puerto Rico right now. Uh, I, I, I suspect you didn't grow up in Fajardo and you didn't grow up in Puerto Rico. Where did you where did you grow up where you got this love of sailing? Well, I'm a third generation Chicagoan. Wait. And I really didn't. <laughs> yep. Third generation Chicagoan. And I, I was raised, of course, by the shores of Lake Michigan. Mm-hmm. I never, I, mean, I didn't start sailing in Lake Michigan until many years later. But I always wondered what was on the other side. I spent eight years in the Navy. And uh, when I first moved to Puerto Rico in the 1950s, I used to sail on the bum boats back and forth uh, to the small islands from Puerto Rico. And that really, really tempered uh, my idea of someday having a great sail. So I went back to Chicago and I raced and sailed there. But basically, I started in Puerto Rico uh, with my sailing career, and I went on from there back to the States and ultimately ended up uh, sailing out of Boston on my around-the-world trip. Well, I am delighted that my hometown has a, has a role in your uh, adventure. Well, thank you very much. Your hometown also has a, a member of the Sailing Hall of Fame. Uh, I was inducted last October. Wonderful. Congratulations. Yeah. it's It's been a whirlwind life so far. I guess so. Now, you mentioned that you had uh, not two grandkids following you, but 30,000 um, kids, grandkids that you call them, uh, following your, your trip. How did that come about? Well, what happened is when I when I uh, decided that I was going to do this, I happened to be at my elementary school reunion. And you know, as reunions go, everyone brags about what they're, they've been doing in their life. And I happened to mention that I was going to sail around the world. Well, the principal grabbed me immediately and said, you must come and tell the students of this school since you went to this school. So I said, okay. 
I came back, talked to some of the students. They asked me to write to them like I was going to write to my grandchildren. I said, fine. A week later, I got a call from the head of curriculum for Chicago Public School Systems because the teacher whose class I was going to call right back to told a friend. Her friend called the Department of Education and said, why wasn't her school getting this program? <laughs> so they called me and said, uh, what's this all about? I told them, and I, I was going to talk to them right to my elementary school. She said, oh, no, you can't do that. You must include a program for the entire school system. So there I was, and that's when I lost control, and I ended up with the Chicago public school system. And my sponsors, who came on later from Boston, said, we want our school system to be in there too. So that's what happened. I had a friend who developed a computer and educational program. Uh, they did one in Boston. And those two cities co combined to make the 30,000 kids who followed me around the world. Wow. That's that's really incredible. So I, I have to add, you know, sailing, my, my daughter's fiance's father just fell in love with sailing from, from out of nowhere, and he has his own boat, and he is really into it. But sailing is... It's it's a lot different than jumping in the motorboat and just you know going out for uh, you know a, a, a ride from one island to another. We've done that. We've we've traveled from Fajardo to some of the little islands off the coast of Puerto Rico many times in my cousin's um, uh, motorboat. But sailing that's a it's it's a really physically challenging activity for somebody, and to do it alone is um, just incredible. Well, actually, it's not as physical, ch physically challenging as um, people might think. At least now, nowadays it isn't. Of course, in the olden days, with those ships, it took a lot of people uh, because everything was mechanical, block and tackle. But today, with all of the resources we have of mechanical winches, electrical winches, sail hoist, navigation, autopilots, it is a lot easier. And the boat that I had was a boat that was used to sail around the world in the uh, nonstop sail sailboat race. So it was equipped and built specifically for a single person to manage and to handle all of it. So I handled it very easily uh, in most cases uh, because it was designed to do just that. Wow. Wow. How long did this trip take you? I was gone 22 months. 22 uh, that's months. 200 200 and some odd days at sea, uh, which was, uh, like I said, I stopped five times. Wow. And when you stopped, was it just a, you know, a, a quick visit, run to the restroom, or was it? did you stay for a while? <laughs> well, I stayed. I had to reprovision, of course. Okay. I, so, and I had, to, I had to make uh, repairs on a couple of occasions, minor repairs, however. And uh, so I would stop. I stopped in. Bermuda on my way out, Salvador Bahia in in uh, Brazil, Cape Town, South Africa, Hobart, Tasmania, and Punta del Este, Uruguay. And in each of those places, I stopped on an average of about uh, five to six days, with the exception of, of uh, Tasmania, because I missed the time to go to Cape Horn, because you can only go in the Southern Hemisphere summer. I stayed in Cape Town longer than I thought I was going to stay. And then uh, when I got to Tasmania, it was too late uh, for me to head for, for Cape Horn. So I went back to the States, and I visited some of the schools that were following me and told them what my progress had been up to date and got a chance, a lot of chance for them to see me uh, as a real person and not just a voice on the, uh, on the radio or or a spot on the computer screen. Wow. Wow. I'm curious, what were some of the questions that the kids were asking you when you visited them? Oddly enough, I think an impact, and I don't know how this impact has continued to, to trickle down to young people today or when I came back. First thing they asked me is, did you see any sharks? I, I, I never knew where that came from. Uh, the other thing was, uh, where did you go to the bathroom? Um, and what did you eat? 
Mm-hmm. Those are the things. Uh, were you afraid? Uh, and uh, what did and and uh, and why did you do it in the first place? And those questions were, those are the top questions. Then I got little personal questions about my my grandchildren, about uh, the people that I met and I saw. So they're very interesting questions. I've got stacks and stacks of letters uh, from kids. I've kept all of them. And I wrote a first grade book when I came back. And so I've got tons of first grade letter letters with scrawly handwriting and little pictures in them uh, from the kids who who uh, followed me or read the, the, the first grade book I wrote. Wow. wow. Well, I'm not going to ask you where you went to the bathroom. And you told us a little bit about Thank your you. ins- inspiration for the book. But I found that, that that question about were you afraid, um, I think that that's a, a pretty relevant um, question. Where Did you find yourself afraid at any time during the trip? Well, here's the thing about it. I, I didn't tell anybody I was going to do it or I wanted to do it for at least a year before I, I told anyone. And I thought about it and I pondered it because I knew that it could be very, very dangerous. And the thing that I had to come to grips with uh, was my own mortality uh, about dying. I think we all have to do that at some point in our life. For me, I had to think about that. And now I was 55 years old and I thought about it. And I said, look, if I don't do this now, I'll never do it. Mm -hmm. The chances of something happening to me are going to be there no matter where I go or what I do. And when I talked to uh, Sir Robin, he was telling me, he says, it's just as dangerous if you're going to cross the Atlantic as if you're going to sail around the world. So finally, I came to peace with my own mortality that what I wanted to do was worth the risk that I would have to take. And from then on, I never thought about it again. Uh, Fear is something that happens about the unknown. Mm -hmm. If you go into a dark room and you don't know what's in there, uh, you can be afraid. But you turn on the lights and you see there's nothing to be afraid of or you see something you should get away from, then you have something to, to think about. Me, I knew about the sea. I knew what the perils were. So I accepted those and I was never afraid of them. Was I concerned about things? Yes. I didn't want to lose the boat because if I, if the boat sank and I didn't sink with it, that meant that I have to go back and start all over again. And that was the hardest part, raising the money and getting the boat. Mm, mm, I imagine so. Uh, you, you mentioned money. Uh, what, what does it cost to do something like this? Well, it can cost uh, very little. Uh, when I say very little, that means if you have your own boat mm-hmm. and uh, you're going to take it in small steps and do it in five or six years. People b- do it in boats 27, 28 foot, uh, and they go through the Panama Canal. Going around Cape Horn, of course, you're going to need something more than a 28 foot boat. But uh, having that, having the the facility to get repairs, to get provisions, to do all of that, uh, from my case, uh, and to have the telecommunication, that was very expensive, but using the satellite time to talk to the schools. Uh, it came, I would say, my trip cost about about oh, close to half a million dollars. Wow. wow. Including the cost of the boat. Mm-hmm. The boat was probably 50% of that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that was a boat that was used to um, go around the world by, by another sailor? Yes, by a young man named Mark Schrader, who'd done it twice. Wow. Wow. I, I think once would be enough for me. I'm not sure. <laughs> For me too. <laughs> <laughs> Were there been ever... there, done that, got the pizza. <laughs> <laughs> Especially if it takes 22 months. Yeah. Now, were there times I'm imagining going crossing the Atlantic, crossing the Pacific? Th- there must have been. Uh, uh, is it weeks at a time where you were just out on the open ocean by yourself? Well, for from uh, Punta del Este uh, to Punta del Este, Uruguay, from Hobart, Tasmania, took sixty-five days. I saw nothing but water, sky, and birds for sixty-five days. How did you keep from? 
How'd you keep from going crazy? Going insane. <laughs> <laughs> well, some people before I before I left, there were some people that thought I already was crazy. <laughs> so there wouldn't have been a big step for me to go from one place to the other. But what it is is that I, I was occupied. Um, I was occupied uh, in keeping uh, the boat maintained and going and following my course, my navigation. But the thing that kept me more than anything else, I read 150 plus books during that whole 22 months. I didn't have a date on Saturday night, so I read. <laughs> wow, that is uh, it, it's it's really really amazing. I that's a you know an adventure is something that you dreamed of, you made it come true. How did this change you? Oh, wow. In so many ways. Uh, I, I tell you, the, the first thing that I learned on this whole trip was patience. You learn patience. Uh, some of the other things I learned was uh, that I was smarter than I thought I was because a lot of the things that happened on the boat that I needed to take care of, I just automatically knew because I had learned them somewhere, somehow. And the second thing I learned after that was that I was dumber than I thought I was <laughs> because it, uh, in that, uh, I didn't know it all. Mm -hmm. uh, sailing is beautiful in the way that it makes you understand that learning is a lifetime experience. You learn something new every day if you pay attention. And that was something that was very, very uh, important for me. Uh, I kept uh, my sanity because I, I was able to talk to the uh, to the students mm -hmm. and get their questions and talk to them. That helped a lot. I talked to my family. Uh, I wrote and, and made uh, tape recordings, really talking to myself about what was happening, which ultimately became my, uh, my autobiography, which I wrote sometime after I returned. And just the focus on knowing that I had 30,000 young people who were depending on me to make happen what I said I was going to make happen. And so that was a driving force that kept me focused on not the situations of the day, but of the long-term journey. Yeah. I, you know, I, I guess that brings up the question, were there times in, in the journey where you said, oh, man, this isn't worth it. I should just tap out. Never. Never. It never came to mind. Uh, my focus was always on getting from day to day because that's how we live our lives, mm -hmm. one minute at a time. And if I didn't focus on uh, what could happen or what may happen and focused on what was happening at the time, the days passed without my realizing it. And when I look back, I'm saying, man, I was out there 65 days on that one stretch. That's a <laughs> long time. But at the time, it was only today. Mm -hmm. That's how I looked at it. What do I have to do today to make this happen? Yeah, incredible. Well, what's what's next for Captain Bill Pinckney? Um, are you thinking of teaming up with Elon Musk and maybe you know going for a sail up to <laughs> Mars? Or I don't think that's uh, going to be on on my my checklist for the next <laughs> in the next few years. Is that? Uh, at this point, um, I had a charter uh, boat business here in Puerto Rico when I would take uh, visitors over to the British Virgin Islands. My wife and I would do that. We had a 40-foot boat. And uh, COVID uh, really killed us. Mm -hmm. We ended up having to dissolve the company and the boat because it, we couldn't afford the upkeep since mm -hmm. there was no income coming in. And so I, I put my focus then on finishing my children's book, which is the book that you talk about, Sailing Around the World. Uh, with Captain Bill Pinckney, uh, on working on that, uh, and I've done that, and so now I'm uh, working on marketing that. I'm also working on my next book, which is going to be about my experience as a memoir of sailing the replica of the of the Freedom Schooner Amistad, mm. uh, which was the boat on which the first that was part of what made the first human rights case in the U.S. Supreme Court uh, a reality. And uh, that's what I'm working on now, and I'll be working on that, I guess, for the next year or so. 
and I go sailing with my friends. I'm a member of the OPYC, which means the Other People's Yacht Club. You don't have to pay any dues, and you don't have to pay for the boat when it gets broken. <laughs> I, I think I like that club. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's one of the best. <laughs> Well, I know the book you uh, is is beautifully illustrated by our friend Pam C. Rice, and so you know that I was interested. The minute I knew that she was involved with the project, I was interested because she's such an amazing illustrator and an author in her own right. And yes. I'm so happy that she connected us. And I know people are going to want to know where they can go to find out more about you and about this um, amazing journey. Well. The first place about the book and about some about what I was doing been doing lately, if you go to www Captain Bill Pinkney, P I N K N E Y, all spelled out dot com, uh my website is where you can get the book. You can also find out about uh the things I've been doing in the last last few years. And uh if you go to YouTube and just type in Captain Bill Pinkney, you'll get uh a plethora of things about which uh, you'll find out all of my visible secrets. Awesome. Awesome. We've had a really fascinating conversation with the, 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 an amazing man who's written a beautiful children's book, Sailing Commitment. Our guest has been Captain Bill Pinckney. Captain Bill, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. It's really been an enjoyable conversation. Please be sure to join us for the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Our guest will be Melissa Stewart. She is coming back to the show to celebrate mega predators of the past. What a great episode. Lots of, lots of fun. And Melissa is a fascinating author of so many fantastic STEM books. And she outdoes herself with this brand new one. I want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. First, I want to thank our guest, Captain Bill Pinckney. Please be sure to check out Sailing Commitment. Also, I want to thank my team, Fatima Khan, Rory Grady, Mirabella Q, Jordan Saley, Skylar Strauss, Stephanie Davila. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. Most of all, we all want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of The Reading with Your Kids podcast.